So anyway, uh, for the very last talk of the uh, day and the, and the forum, I'd like to welcome Jack Burns, who is going to talk about the elusive why of space exploration. Jack. Thank you, Greg. And um, thank you, everybody, for still being here. Um, it's late, and I know you've postponed your first margarita. Uh, I know I'm looking forward to one after, after this. Let me uh, start off today uh, with a question. And the question is, why do we explore space? Since the end of the Apollo program, the answer to that question has proven to be quite elusive. So what I want to do is I want to probe with you today some thoughts about why we explore. And it's based on an article uh, that was published in Space News that Sandy Magnus and I uh, published together, co-authored together. She and I were both part of the presidential transition team on NASA, and our team as a whole really spent a good bit of time thinking uh, about the why of space exploration. So if we could have the next slide, um, Ashkan. So going back to the early days of the space program, the why was very clear as laid out by John Kennedy in 1962 in what was probably the most famous speech on um, space policy given at Rice University in 1962. Let's listen to just a little bit of that famous speech. Uh, Ashcon, go ahead and play. Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal, will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. Why do we go to the moon? Not because it is easy, but because it is hard. And it is hard. It's hard. Space is hard. We know that um, in general. Um, in today's parlance, we'd probably call that speech an example of American exceptionalism because it was all about America first, about putting it uh, first and foremost. But we know from historians like John Logston, who studied the Kennedy administration in detail, that Kennedy wasn't really all that passionate about space. Uh, the goal of the uh, Apollo program really was about beating the Russians. It was a Cold War error. Uh, and um, it was about embarrassing Nikita Khrushchev um, at that period of time. However, once the goal was achieved that America made it to the moon first, the reason for space exploration evaporated, and so did Apollo, and so did our ability to explore space. It's been uh, 45 years since Apollo 17, uh, since we last left Earth orbit. More recently, people have talked about a variety of different reasons for why we explore. Here's just one uh, from Stephen Hawking. Hawking has talked a fair bit in recent years about exploration. But you know, he points out, as I think most of us would agree, that the situation today is somewhat like uh, the pre-Columbus voyage, uh, voyages in 1492. Spreading out into space will completely change our future but won't solve our immediate problems. There's not a magic bullet that investment of billions of dollars in space is gonna cure our needs. But yet, we have this feeling that um, when we do begin um, exploration seriously out into the solar system, it's really gonna change who we are and what we're all about. Next slide, please. The problem has been, though, over the last 50 years, uh, we've drifted away from asking why because it's hard, and instead we tend to ask how and what about space exploration. Uh, because there's neat toys that we have to play with. Uh, here in this uh, example, um, we've got uh, the Orion uh, and SLS, which is getting ready to launch in just a couple of years, uh, potentially leading to uh, a deep space gateway in cislunar space, a permanent presence. Uh, for us to begin exploring 
the environs of the moon and possibly the surface. At the same time, we've got bold companies like SpaceX on the commercial side, uh, Blue Origin uh, and others that we just heard about, um, and um, folks like Elon Musk um, presenting options for uh, human missions, possible commercial human missions uh, to Mars as well. So again, that's exciting. These are great fun toys to talk about, but it's not as fundamental as the why. Next slide, please. There's also the where we explore. We spent a lot of time talking about where we should explore. Um, and the two most obvious places, um, let's see, Ashcon, I think there's another video here that we want to play on the left, if we can get that going as well. Um, there is the moon uh, and there's Mars. Uh, both of them are science priorities as well as exploration priorities. Both were priorities in the Planetary Science Decadal Survey um, in which sample returns uh, were key. In the case of the moon, uh, returning a sample from the South Pole Lake and Basin. Uh, my uh, good friend and colleague, uh, David Kring, makes a really good case for uh, going to the Schrodinger Impact Basin uh, to really study the lunar cataclysmic uh, hypothesis. In the case of Mars, we're talking about returning a sample because it's all about life. Does, did life spring up on Mars? Uh, and Mars 2020, uh, 2020 is the first step of three potential missions to return samples to help address some of those questions. Next slide, please. And then there's the tools. The tools for exploration in the last 50 years have also gotten much more exciting, uh, particularly interface uh, with um, uh, computer-based um, and robotic uh, exploration. Uh, here's one example that my group, my colleagues at Lockheed Martin, Terry Fong here at NASA Ames, all been working together using surface telerobotics. Uh, a few years ago, we did an experiment in which the K-10 rover here at Ames, at the NASA uh, Roverscape, uh, was driven by an astronaut. It was the first time we had a human in space directly controlling a surface asset. Um, and that uh, experiment was successful in deploying a prototype uh, backbone to uh, a potential future radio telescope that we would like to emplace on the moon. Uh, and at the same time, such experiments, uh, such technologies open up opportunities for students. Here are two of my students at Colorado, uh, Ben and Matt, who uh, have presented posters at this meeting uh, with a COTS uh, rover uh, that uh, they built and we've been experimenting with to understand uh, issues of bandwidth and latency in terms of um, the ability to identify exploration targets. So all of that's great. If we can go to the next slide. But really fundamentally, when it comes down to selling space to the public and to the Congress, it still is the why. It's still about the why. What I want to do is, is a following um, um, an approach that Simon Sinek has taken, I want to address a why question specifically for space. He draws a simple uh, graphic like what you see here with why being at the center that he calls the golden circle and surrounded in the periphery by how and what as being related but not central like why. Sinek makes the case that very few organizations really know why they do what they do. What is their purpose? Why does the organization really exist? He turns to Apple to look at an example of an organization that thinks differently in this regard. He says that if Apple were like everyone else, it might sound something like the following. We make great computers. They are beautifully designed and user friendly. Do you want to buy one? Okay, maybe. What most organizations do is say what they do, they say how they're different, and then they expect you to go out and purchase them. But Apple really is fundamentally different, and it's derived, I think, directly from the way Steve Jobs thought about these things. Something like this is what Cynic said, that Apple approaches. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We think differently. The way to challenge the status quo is by making beautifully designed, user-friendly products. We just happen to make great computers. Do you want to buy one? Well, that sounds more exciting. That's rebellious, okay? And 
They want you, Apple, to be part of the rebellion. How about if we apply this to space and space exploration? Maybe it could go something like this. We believe in challenging the status quo. We think differently. We thirst for knowledge on where we came from, our destiny, and if we are alone. We build beautifully designed rockets, telescopes, and tools for exploration. Want to join in the adventure? We want you to be rebels with us, okay? This is what NASA was like, as we heard from Jack Schmidt the other day. Folks in their 20s being rebels, because they had to be rebels. The technology in the 1960s was such that none of what we use today was in existence at that time, okay? And so challenging the status quo was really what NASA was all about. Similarly, uh, we hear Elon Musk present a very similar look at SpaceX. We're rebels. We build rockets differently. We build them more cheaply. We look at how space exploration is. NASA needs to be thinking about returning to being more of a rebel. And that means less about the status quo, less about being risk averse. This is one of the things we talked a lot about uh, during our uh, transition team and being able to take on um, a posture that thinks boldly, willing to take some chances, try some new things, and being a pirate. Next slide. So the justification for space exploration, it works for Apple. Let's have it work for space. Let's be just outright inspirational. Humans are meant to explore. It's in our core. It's in our DNA. We explore to gain knowledge, to satisfy our curiosity. Space is that next frontier. It's a simple answer to why we explore. And if we're rebellious about it, humans by nature will join the cause to go along. Then after addressing the why question, we can start thinking about things like what should we explore? And clearly a single destination is not sufficient. We learned that from Apollo. By having a single destination, exploration really ended. And I'm worried that the same is true if Mars is our single destination. Because if life turns out to be much more difficult to find on Mars, or maybe not even existent, then that once again could end the exploration program in a few years. We need a multitude of destinations, a multitude of places which happen to be available for us to uh, explore. And then to go along with it, not only the search for basic life, but is there intelligent life in the galaxy is an intriguing question that should be at the heart of what we do. Next one, please. So a sustainable program. I hear a lot of time, over, over and over again, I've heard for you the last five, 10 years, should we explore the moon or Mars? No, wrong question. It's the moon and Mars. And for the reasons we just heard from Alan Stern and others a few minutes ago, we have an advance in the commercial sector now. We heard a lot during the transition about public-private partnerships, such that now there are lots of companies, a few of which I've already mentioned, are ready to join forces with us to explore the moon, look for resources. There are business plans which under a way uh, underway for uh, that development. That then frees up some resources and capability for NASA and the international programs to begin exploring Mars at the same time. We can do both in this era today. Next slide, please. And that shouldn't be the end. Alan also mentioned the water worlds. Very different places to look for life than Mars. Um, those water worlds which are the moons um, around uh, Jupiter and Saturn, uh, like Europa and Enceladus, may in fact be the key places, the better places potentially, to search for life. We have at least one congressman from Texas that's really excited about Europa and has earmarked considerable money um, in the NASA bills over the last few years for um, initially a, um, an orbiter and then potentially followed up by a lander, uh, looking for those vents of water uh, that may have biogenic material uh, coming out of those and um, uh, looking for the opportunity for life. Europa is a very harsh environment and lots and lots of challenges uh, in trying to uh, go there. 
And then finally, next, in terms of looking outward, exoplanets. Next slide, please. Exoplanets. We're already exploring exoplanets, but we're doing it with telescopes. The Kepler mission has been extraordinary. Over 4,000 extrasolar planets have been detected, dozens that are Earth-like, and it's really exciting. We've learned a lot. The planets look very different than what we thought from our own solar system. Uh, here's a highly stylized cartoon uh, that one of my colleagues in NESS, um, uh, Greg Hallinan, presented yesterday, um, in which what we find is that the majority of systems that have exoplanets are M dwarf stars. These are cooler, lower mass, and the planets in the habitable zone are closer to their parent star. But there's a problem. We've discovered with Kepler and other missions that these stars are much more active. They flare, they have coronal mass ejections, and we've learned from MAVEN that likely Mars' atmosphere was stripped early on because of the more extreme solar weather that existed in our solar system. And uh, Mars didn't have a planet-wide magnetic field like the Earth did to protect it. So we need to learn more about these systems as targets for potential uh, life. And we can do that with uh, next generation mission star shades um, with this uh, petal-like aperture here that will suppress the light from the bright stars and allow us to not only image but take spectra of the atmospheres of these stars. And then using uh, some of our low frequency radio telescope arrays on the lunar far side to probe the weather in these conditions. The coronal mass ejections in our solar system emit low frequency radio emission below 10 megahertz. We have to go to the moon to be able to do those observations. We can apply that uh, technology in a better environment uh, to these systems and understand the weather in these systems and also eventually uh, to be able to um, detect and image magnetospheres through the plasma radiation at low frequencies that they emit. Maybe eventually we'll get to uh, interstellar travel. Uh, there's been some interesting thinking on this, um, maybe at the, uh, at the end of the century or the next century. Last slide, please. So to just leave you with a few closing thoughts, um, a sustainable space program that's also inspirational, well-designed, and well-executed uh, has to drive advances in science and technology. It has to expand opportunities for everyone. It has to have diversity at its core as well-defined. So diversity in terms of um, uh, 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 gender diversity uh, and uh, diversity for ethnic, um, different ethnic classes, but also diversity in terms of uh, international collaborations. It has to open up space to everybody to be part of this. Again, being a, a rebel, join us. Enhance and expand knowledge, education, innovation, economic vitality, and finally, it needs to also help advance what we know about our own home world. So getting back to this, it has to begin with a stimulating why. And that why then can lead to the how and what of exploration. But let's start off being pirates and take the solar system by storm. Thank you. Thank you, Jack, very much for a, a wonderfully inspiring closing talk. I have one word. Arr. Arr. <laughs> I was waiting for someone to say that. So. Oh, wait, stay here in case we have some All right. Questions. Yeah. Are there any questions uh, for Jack? Pam? Um, so, in my experience, Jack, most ordinary Americans, most people are actually <laughs> intrinsically interested in space. If you publish anything even today with the word Apollo on it, you're going to sell a lot of copies of whatever it is. So, to me, it seems the hard people to deal with are really the people who allocate resources, who don't seem to be excited about space. And I, I don't know, do you think the pirate approach will work with them. It's a very risk-averse culture, the, the, the people that make those It, it works for Apple. Um, their, uh, now um, their uh, uh, capital value is greater than General Motors, um, and that rebel attitude has grown. Um, I do agree with you, though, that I think most people, I mean, we've all had these experiences on airplanes, right? Sitting next to someone, uh, they 
look at your slides that you have on your laptop. You work for NASA or you work in it, oh, yeah, and you spend the next two hours talking about it. But I also disagree with you. We have some real genuine supporters on Capitol Hill that are very interested in space. Um, and in fact, the reason NASA's budget is as good as it is now, given the relative lack of interest in the last administration uh, for uh, space, is that it was plussed up by those friends on the Hill. We may not always agree with all of their positions, uh, but there's a genuine interest for space. What we need to present to them is an exciting agenda to go along with that, that we are willing to take some risks. We are willing to think differently and try things um, in a different fashion and, and uh, expand out, explore out in a bolder fashion. So when you say we, are you, who do you mean by we? I mean all of us. Uh, I mean NASA. I mean the commercial sector. Uh, because it's working together where the real power is. I mean, again, this is one of the things I saw during transition that hand in hand, uh, working uh, with the commercial sector, working with an administration that's interested, working with a Congress that's interesting, that's interested, um, there's opportunities to do things that not only involve returning to the moon, but continue to explore outward. I'm, I'm optimistic at this stage. I'm not sure I'm always an optimistic person, but I'm an optimist in this case that, uh, that this era, this new era of exploration will be possible. Well, Jack, we're, we're very glad that, uh, that you're both with us here today and that you were on that transition team. Uh, I, I myself would like to thank you for that. Yeah. Um, we can take perhaps one more question if anyone has one. Yeah, yeah, not quite yet, Jack. Uh, yeah. Right All right. Um, so, hey, Paul. Yeah. So, Paul Niles, Johnson Space Center. Um, the uh, so the way I think about this and is that it seems I see I seem like there and this is a Paul Spudis formulation, but he's he had this like ternary diagram that he that he had and on one corner is science, one corner is exploration, and one corner is um, settlement, and so. He, and, and, I, and I really feel like this is, this, we're sort of stuck, and, and no one will really sort of commit to one or the other. It seems like at NASA, we're pretty much on the exploration corner, as far as human exploration goes. Um, but, um, but there's a lot of people who want to do settlement, and then, you know, there's some people who want to just do science. And, and I think that's the sort of, the, the why um, tension that, we've de that we're dealing yeah, with. Yeah, and, 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 and you, you put a, a really good point out. It's one that um, I really emphasize a lot in um, our report that we did up to the White House, and that is we need to break down these stovepipes that we have right now uh, within NASA between exploration and science, because as we move outward uh, into the solar system, getting back to the surface of the moon, going to Mars, science uh, and uh, robotic program and exploration have to be hand in hand. It's really one and the same. And organizationally, we're not well structured right now within NASA to do that uh, as well as we should be and could be. Uh, and so that's an institutional barrier that I think can be and will be overcome um, in future years to move this out. But it really is at a core of what we should be doing differently. Um, all right, one more, okay. So, uh, Paul Abel, NASA Johnson. So, in that vein, do you envision uh, something like the Joint Robotic Precursor Program coming back? Something like that, where you had both SMD and HOMD, uh, you know, strategic knowledge gap, science, hand in hand, coming? Do you think? Yeah, I see something bolder than that. Um, I see um, uh, putting together um, uh, uh, Moon and Mars programs that have equal. Uh, components of SMD and HEOMD and STMD all working together, uh, not dominated by one or the other um, to move that forward. We need to put structures like that into place to uh, be able to develop that new paradigm. Okay. All right, let's, uh, let's thank Jack again. Thank you so much. <clears throat>